Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch. Welcome today to my review of this, the Tissot Gentleman with the Paramatic 80 automatic movement. Now I unboxed this one on the channel a couple of months ago and initial impressions were favorable, shall we say, so I thought it was high time I came back with a full review today. Now this one was sent to me for free by Joma Shop. As such, this video is sponsored by Joma Shop. Joma are one of the world's largest online retailers of watches. They're based in New York, but they ship internationally. They're a gray market retailer. What that means is the watch is the same, the packaging's the same, but they warrant the watches themselves. That is one of the reasons why their prices are super sharp. I say it in every Joma Shop sponsored video, even if you don't end up buying from them, you would be mad not to check out their prices, to use them as a bit of a reference because their prices are often the best in the business. This Tissot, for example, comes in at less than $550. They're even cheaper, they're under $500 on the leather strap, a little more expensive if you go for the blue dialed auto. I will leave links to all of those in the description of the video today. Now, this gentleman has been out for about 12 months now and has got some very favorable coverage elsewhere on YouTube. I think a lot of people were expecting this one to be the natural successor, the heir apparent, if you will, to the venerable Seiko Saab that was discontinued a couple of years ago and it's easy to see why. It's a kind of similar look and has a very similar set of specifications to the Saab. So is this Tissot the perfect gentleman then? Is it the Saab successor that we were all hoping it would be? Well actually it reminds me far more of another Seiko and I'll talk about that a bit later on. Let's flip the camera and get on with it. Now I must say I am personally very fond of this style of watch, the Gada watch, the go anywhere do anything watch, a watch that in theory is equally comfortable right across the spectrum regardless of what you're doing or what outfit you're wearing from black tie dinner jackets to shirt and suit to jeans to shorts and t-shirt right down to budgie smugglers on the beach at the weekends. Dive watches tend to struggle at the formal end of the spectrum unless of course you're James Bond they don't tend to look too good in black tie whereas bezel-less slightly dressier numbers tend to struggle the more informal your outfit becomes particularly if you're wearing budgie smugglers. This one though, you know, it's still got all the right specs, it's still got 100 meters of water resistance, so there really is no reason why you cannot get this one wet at the weekends if you so choose. Now, I always mention Tissot packaging. This is the kind of standard packaging you get with a Tissot from about $200 up, and I always say that if you want to look like you've spent a lot of money on someone, buy them a Tissot because this stuff is great. There's a little catalog and there's a little history book, the story of a watch company, detailing their journey since 1853. Inside you have got a little couple of hidden pouches here, one for the warranty card information and the other one very neatly to store your spare links in. And as with all Swatch Group products, you get this nice little hang tag with the original RRP of 775, so $200 more than the Joma Shop price, with a bit of an indicator as to the spec sheet on this one. So stainless steel, 100 meters of water resistance, the rotor designating an automatic, and that is sapphire with a non-reflecting, i.e. anti-reflective undercoating there as well. And overall with this one, I think you're getting a well-made, well-spec watch from a very well-regarded Swiss brand. Contemporary styling, handsome looking watch, perhaps a little understated though. Tissot generally as a brand tend to undercook rather than overcook their designs. I think for a lot of people though, Tissot is a long-term purchase. And indeed, if you are looking at one of these or anything else as what perhaps is gonna be your main watch or even your only watch for the next few years or even the next few decades, then I think a slightly understated look is always going to be a good long-term buy. So in terms of the dimensions, 40 mil in diameter, 10 and a half mil thick, very slim. If you are gonna be slipping this one under a shirt cuff Monday to Friday, you have no problems, very neat side profile. Slightly long lug to lug at 48 and a half, 21 mil lug width, now that will be appearing in the moans and niggles section later on. There is a touch of taper on this bracelet, narrowing down to 20 at the butterfly clasp, and sized up for me, I've got a seven inch wrist. This one weighs in at a not inconsiderable though, 153 grams. So there's certainly a bit of chunk to this one. 
Stainless steel construction throughout, three piece case, we have a high polished fixed bezel, stainless steel crown, and a full stainless steel bracelet with solid links and solid end links. It's a proper three link oyster, these are all separate links today, and it has push pins. Butterfly clasp I showed you earlier on. Now butterfly clasp, we do have half links here, a number of spare links, I think an eight inch wrist, up to eight and a quarter, no problems at all. I've got a few scratches on this one already. Because it only has half links, it doesn't have micro adjust, you are gonna be left with the probable choice of wearing this one either slightly too tight or slightly too loose, and slightly too loose is usually the preference. I have been wearing this one a bit too loose personally. Sapphire crystal with anti-reflective undercoating as stated on the hang tag. There is a little bit of curvature, a little bit of doming on that one and 100 meters of water resistance. Only a push-pull crown though, so you can manually wind this one. It doesn't have a screw down crown at all. In reality though, that's not a big issue. I trust the gaskets, I trust Tissot. I've had no problem swimming with other watches that have had this arrangement, 100 meters, but without the screw down crown. Case finishing is a mixture of brushed and polished. Case profile reminds me very much of the Tissot PR100. There's a distinctive Tissot DNA with those slightly upturned tips to the lugs. I've looked at a couple of PR100s on the channel and been impressed with what you get for the money. This gentleman, a little more expensive, but you can see where some of that money has gone. Nice fine brush to the mid case. We've got a Tissot branded high polished crown. Nice fine brushing to the upper lugs and a high polished chamfered edge running the length of the case just adding a bit of finesse, but also adding another high polished surface. So high polished surface on the bezel, high polished surface on the edge there, and high polished surface to those mid links. Do bear in mind if you are wearing this one as a daily, high polished surfaces will scratch and scuff far more noticeably than the equivalent brush surface. So if you're rough on your watches, do remember that. So contemporary and handsome, but understated, that definitely applies to the dial and to the handset. Mild sunburst effect on the dial, you can just about see it there. It's one of these dials that if you look at it under macro, it looks slightly gritty, it looks slightly textured, but that translates to a mild sunburst effect once it is on your wrist. So Tissot 1853, the brand name and the year that they were founded, just printed on the dial under the index at 12. Paramatic 80, that's the movement, and silicium, referring to the silicone balance spring contained within that movement, printed underneath the pinion, and Swiss made under the index at six o'clock and those are lovely applied indexes. So faceted, chamfered edges, high polish to the edges, brush to the upper surfaces, and they taper towards the pinion. Similarly, the handset taper out towards the indexes. It's a very cohesive look overall from this one, if, as I said, slightly plain and slightly understated. There's a kind of double frame around the color match date complication at the three o'clock in the kind of more traditional position there as well. Now there is a little bit of loom on the hands and the indexes. I'll put the loom video in now. It's okay, it's not all that spectacular. I'm guessing BGW9 given that ice white hue, better than nothing. I guess loom is obligatory for a genuine Gada watch. It had to have some loom. I've seen better, I've seen worse. So the loom may not be part of the appeal today, but I think this movement most certainly is. Tissot are a member of the Swatch group of companies. Swatch owns ETA. This is a Powermatic 80, which is essentially a slowed down ETA 2824. So it's a 25 joule hacking and hand winding bi-directional winding automatic, but rather than beating at four hertz, so 28,800 vibrations per hour, they slow it down to three hertz, 21,600 vibrations per hour. You lose the high beat sweep, but you nearly double the power reserve from 42 all the way up to 80, meaning you can take this one off on a Friday, leave it on your bedside table and pop it back on on a Monday morning. It will still be ticking, but how accurately will it be ticking? Let's pop this one on the time grapher and find out. Yeah, so I appreciate one watch, one position, but you'd be pretty happy if you picked up one of these for $550, and not only did it have an 80 hour power reserve, but it was also just scraping within cost parameters to boot. And that's it on wrist, seven inch wrist as mentioned. Certainly a comfortable watch. I've been wearing this one over the last couple of days, wearing it slightly loose because as discussed, you've got the choice of half link or full link. You don't quite have the versatility that you get from micro adjusts. Crown is nice and small, nice and discreet, doesn't dig into the back of your hand if you do choose to wear this one loose, but it is quite a big watch. This is definitely one of the biggest 40s that I have worn. 
Now it's got a reasonable size polished bezel, so it's not necessarily all dial. I think it looks and feels big because of the polished surfaces and because of those protruding mid links of the end links. 150 grams is also a fair weight for a 40 mil watch of this style. That's why I think this is where the comparisons with the Saab 033 start to fall away. It reminds me far more of my Seiko Sarx 043 that I had a couple of years ago and also the Seiko Sari 057 that I reviewed towards the middle of last year as well. Particularly the 057 because it has that protruding mid-link of the end link as well. Now the fact that it's a big 40 is going to suit some guys down to the ground, but it's also going to be a bit of a red flag for guys who prefer a slightly smaller than average watch. Now legibility isn't a problem in terms of its proportions. It's a good size handset, good size indexes, nice and clear in that respect. I hope you haven't noticed too much. I've been having a hell of a problem filming this one. I don't think there's an awful lot of anti-reflective coating on that crystal today and all those high poly surfaces have been smudging like a bugger. It's not an easy watch to film. Now I guess that means if you are gonna be wearing this one as a daily, you're also gonna be dealing with quite a bit of flecto and quite a bit of smudging on the bezel and on those polished mid links. Nice side profile though, I highlighted that earlier on as well. Looks great on wrist and it's gonna slip under a cuff imperceptibly I reckon. Moans and niggles, well you are gonna have to get used to smudges and you are gonna have to get used to flecto if you buy one of these. Hello, how you doing? So do bear that in mind. And 21 millimeter lug width. I always complain about watches that have non-standard, i.e. not 18, 20 or 22 mil lug width. Inevitably, people in the comment section say, oh, why are you giving it a hard time? It's not a big deal. Hands up, who would choose 21 over 20 or 22? I just don't know how many people would actively seek out a watch with a non-standard lug width. It just doesn't make much sense. I don't own a single watch with 21 mil lugs. I don't therefore own a strap with 21 mil lugs. So it's a bit of a pain and certainly limits your options if you are gonna be popping this one on leather. I'm not saying you can't buy them. I'm just saying you probably haven't already bought them. And then there's the looks. I reckon it might actually be a little bit overdone for some people with all of these high polished surfaces and the faceted light grabbing indexes. And yet at the same time, it's gonna be a little bit plain Jane for some, a little bit underdone. So it's treading a fine line, this tea. So I'm sure it will find its market, but have a good look at this review. Have a good look at all the other reviews of this watch, just to make sure that it is the one for you before you pull the trigger. But if you can see yourself wearing one of these long term, I reckon it could be a very rewarding experience. Mid 500s, I reckon it's a great price, very solidly made, no rattle from these end links whatsoever. I've looked at watches far more expensive than that that haven't felt as solidly put together as this one. It certainly feels like it will be with you for decades if that is your plan with it. So there you have it, the Tissot gentlemen. Perhaps not quite perfect, it would need more lume and a bit of anti-reflective coating and a few tweaks here and there as discussed to be heading towards that label. But I think given Seiko's current pricing strategy, their prices are only going up at $550, this one makes a pretty strong claim for itself. Perhaps not the Seiko Saab replacement that we all thought it was gonna be, perhaps more a Seiko Sartre replacement. Thank you for watching, I will see you in a future video.